Coming up in this edition of Nebraska Stories, a profile of the most beautiful man in the world, a visit with second generation saddle maker Lyle Henderson. What do Batman and Shakespeare have in common? Two words, Bob Hall. And a three-time cancer survivor shows us the power of positive thinking. Paul Swan was a dancer, an artist, a poet. He was what they referred to as a Renaissance man. He was America's Leonardo. He was always searching for beauty, and he did everything he could to try to find that. Curator Russell Urpelding has spent the last five years searching for beauty as well, trying to find the paintings, sculptures, and other lost works created by a once famous and now obscure former Nebraskan. He was meticulous about collecting and preserving his own accolades. He would collect these and would paste them in his own scrapbooks. His arrival in any city was big news at that time. He was a celebrity. He traveled all over. He was in Paris, he was in London, he was in Berlin, South America. In this first major retrospective of Swan's work, the Museum of Nebraska Art hopes to shine a light on the life and work of this forgotten artist. The interesting thing about Paul Swan was that he was famous at one time and then fell into obscurity. He was a great artist. He knew lots of famous artists as well. He was in the circles of art on a major level. Paul Swan created sculptures of some of the most famous people of his day, like John F. Kennedy and Willa Cather. The Cather bus resides at the state capitol. But Paul Swan did not see himself as an artist. He saw himself as a dancer. And the artwork was his ways of financing his passion for dance. This worldly refined artist came from humble beginnings. His family moved to a farm outside Crab Orchard in 1889 when Paul was just six years old. His existence was to be working out on the farm with the other boys, and that was not his passion. That's where there was a lot of animosity between the children. Um, Paul basically got away with doing what he wanted to do while the other children had to work. But he knew he was always different. He needed a bigger stage, and for Paul, the world was his stage. From a young age and throughout his career, Paul Swan's good looks served him well. In the early 1920s, Paul was, was dancing and Isadora Duncan called him out. She was the one that referred to him as the most beautiful man in the world. She was a pioneer of modern dance and that's what Paul was wanting to do as well. He starred in an early silent film called Diana the Huntress featuring his dancing. In the 1920s, he was cast in Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. He's one of the Egyptian guards. There was supposed to be this elaborate dance scene. There was a disagreement between Paul and Cecil B. DeMille, and Paul left the set and never returned. In later years, the most beautiful man moniker may have been a burden. He tried so hard to stay beautiful. At the end of his life, he was wearing considerable amounts of makeup 
to try to maintain the beauty, bathing in olive oil. If his stomach was sticking out a little too much, he would pencil it in and draw over the top of things. By the 1950s, most of his family had started to pass away. He started to experiment with a lot of different forms of artwork, delving into his own sexuality. He was not dancing as much, but people were still coming to see Paul dance. He was no longer the most beautiful man in the world. He had become more of this eccentric oddity. In 1961, when Paul was evicted from Carnegie Hall, he did go to live at the Van Dyke Hotel, which was where Andy Warhol was at at the time. And that's how they met. It's been great pleasure to introduce the most famous unknown person in New York. Warhol made a film featuring the artist simply called Paul Swan. Paul's had early signs of forgetfulness. When the films came out, he didn't even remember that he had filmed these. It's basically making fun of an old man past his prime trying to dance and trying to please. He's even hollering out that uh, you can cut that, you know, but basically Andy did not do that. This was the... Um the kind of work that I was doing at the time. A few years later, in 1969, Swan's great-nephew visited the 86-year-old artist in New York. I was always just curious to know who he was. I happened to be in New York City uh, on a photo shoot job and went over to see Paul. So I came to the door of Paul's studio, and it was a large door, and I pushed it open slowly, I, I think it even creaked a little bit. Stepped inside and discovered that the door was covered with tapestries on the back, and artwork was hung salon style, floor to ceiling on all the walls. And it just felt like I'd stepped back in time 50 years. And I asked him if I could make a photograph of him, and he was very gracious. He didn't hesitate at all. As I got the camera set up, he just immediately started posing. There was no communication. And he picked up a fragment of a bust and uh, gave me the uh, profile and holding it up. I'm just going, whoa, you know, this is the real deal. I mean, this is a guy who's been there and done it. I didn't have to say a word. He gave it all to me. And I just clicked the shutter and that was it. In 1972, Swan came back to Nebraska for the final time, escorted by his brother Reuben. They had a small funeral for him in New York, and then he was cremated. Reuben drove those to Crab Orchard, um, placed them in a coffee can, and buried them between his mother and father in the small cemetery. While Paul Swan is no longer the toast of the elite, his works live on in private collections and galleries around the world, including at the Museum of Nebraska Art in Kearney. With a larger-than-life reputation, this eccentric, prolific artist will also be remembered as an ordinary person. His presence was not as shocking as I kind of anticipated it to be. I found him to be just a perfectly fine fellow, very cooperative, friendly generous with his time, uh, went away thinking, gosh, he's pretty much a regular guy. All I want to do is be a cowboy. part of it by making saddles. My folks started this business in 1942 here in Kearney, and I was born in 47, and uh, they kept me in a saddle box when I was a baby. So I grew up in the shop. When I was 12 years old, I built my first saddle with the help of my dad. I tried to count up and keep track of what my dad and I have made up to date, as close as I can come, with him and I combined, we've made right at 3,000. And I've probably made 
at least 1,800 of those. But as far as the tooling, he would only use one flower all the time, and Mom did everything different every project she worked on, and that's what I do. Actually, my mom was way better than my dad, and he's, she's the one that taught me how to do that. The idea of tooling like a saddle is it'll last longer because the leather is compressed and it will, it will last longer than a plain saddle will. If you're going to be on a horse a lot, say if you want to be a cowboy, you need a saddle and preferably one that's not going to hurt your horse's back and not going to hurt you. And my dad pretty well taught me that. He said, if you're not happy with the job, don't show it to the customer. Throw it under the bench and start over. My wife is a great quality control person. She really looks at every stitch and, and makes sure, because she always says, we're professionals. and We can't turn out stuff that that looks half done. We have sent saddles to Canada, Germany, Switzerland, Brazil, Japan, England. We were surprised when we first started getting orders from foreign countries. People are absolutely in love with anything to do Western in the United States. With an actual saddle, I do all of the finish work. That means rubbing down the edges because after he cuts them, they're kind of rough, and I rub them down and make them nice and smooth. She is probably one of the best finish people in the business. I've never seen anybody match her. So she, she's a lot of help. I make them shiny and pretty. Maybe that's the way that I, I should uh, say it. There's times at night I'll wake up and get to thinking about something. Two o'clock in the morning, I'll come out here and at least draw it out so I don't forget it. Yes, he is an artist, even if he is humble about it. He's an artist in other mediums if he had time to pursue it. There are the people that go out in the morning when it's still dark, take a halter with them or a catch rope and catch their horse that's snorting at them and saddle them up and take off just as the sun's coming up. Those are celebrities to me. I like to build stuff for working cowboys. An image tells the story. It can convey everything an audience needs to know. It sets the mood. It creates the action. These artists telling the story bring them to life for their audience, sometimes in more ways than one. I see myself as a storyteller. The training to direct, I think, is why I could get a job with Marvel in the 70s um, drawing, is I was able to tell a story with pictures. Bob Hall has been telling stories for nearly 40 years. As a child, he became fascinated with two different types of storytelling, comic books and theater. Passion for drawing and the passion for comics were sort of integrated. When I was five years old, I went to the hospital and they gave me this giant stack of comic books and that uh, ruined my life and uh, <laughs> got me into, uh, I became fascinated by them. Fear no more the lightning flash. Nor the old dreaded thunderstone. It was a good time to be kid, a kid if you were interested in theater because uh, uh, local TV was buying all these old movies and they would show them fairly early. So even as a kid, you could watch and see Olivier's Hamlet and uh, Cyrano de Bergerac and Macbeth and all of these. I, I really got acquainted with them early. Bob's experience with theater at the University of Nebraska led him from Lincoln to the lights of New York City. I was on my way to New York City to be a director 
and in the meantime had continued to draw, but I'd never really studied it. I took a couple of art courses, but nothing too serious, and had a sudden epiphany that, that you needed money in New York and that I had no real way of making money for, until presumably I would get jobs in theater. And a friend of mine suggested, well, why don't you look at drawing comic books? Lucky happenstance, a guy named John Buscema was my mentor, and he was the guy drawing at that time Thor, the Avengers, and uh, I think he was doing the Fantastic Four as well. And so he was one of Marvel's three or four leading artists. And so I, I worked for Marvel and continued to work in comics up until the 90s. While Bob became engrossed in the world of comic book illustration, his passion for theater never died. In the late 1970s, Bob co-wrote a play, The Passion of Dracula, which ran for two years off-Broadway as well as in London. The Passion of Dracula was quite successful. Part of it was timing, it was the right um, era, and, uh, and, and we had quite a little hit of it running at the Cherry Lane Theater in New York for two years, and it was done in London, and it was the first uh, drama filmed for a Showtime. While Bob continued to whet his theatrical appetite, the comic book industry took him on a wild ride. A new company in the 90s called Valiant had put out some feelers to see if I wanted to do some work. So I uh, picked this character named Shadow Man, and then after about three issues, I started drawing it as well as writing it, which was uh, very satisfying. It's a whole different way of, of approaching comics if you're doing both jobs, because you become uh, self-interactive, uh, as, as it were. In the 90s, this huge collector's market occurred, and uh, we were all making very good money because the collectors came in and just were paying enormous amounts for buying up whole runs of comics and stuff. And they seemed to all, within a couple of weeks, realize that they all own the same thing that they thought was rare enough that it was worth a bunch of money is worth less than the original face value because they all own it. They were doing all these things that were very, called variant covers where some of them would be made out of embossed tin foil and uh, holographics and, and the idea was to get you to collect all of the covers and all kinds of new number ones. So there were more comic books than anybody could possibly read. Companies were geared for this big collector market and they just, boom, they just shattered. Most of us who were working in the business are no longer working in the business. There were mass firings and people were let off and uh, as the business has regrown, it's all new people. So uh, I found myself without work in Lincoln, um, wanting to figure out what to do and went back to theater. Coming back to theater meant raising a performance space from the dead. The uh, cemetery at that time was trying to uh, promote the image that it was more than just a cemetery, which historically it had been, and uh, came and looked at this building and said, this looks like a Shakespearean theater. The uh, stables at Wayuka Cemetery, which we've come to call the Swan uh, Theater, uh, after a famous theater in London, but also because of the swans there at the, uh, the lake on the grounds. And Bob just realized that this was an astonishingly effective theatrical space for early modern theater. The stables held horses on the cemetery grounds beginning in the early 1900s, but had since been left unused. From these humble beginnings, Flatwater Shakespeare was born. During the coming year, it will be uh, renovated and restored. And we uh, have not been performing in this building last year or this year because of the pending renovation. <laughs> Give me access of it. That's there is a growing audience for Shakespeare. And the hard sell, I think, has been to convince people that if you come, you will understand it, and very likely you will enjoy it. Because uh, I think there's a lot of people who feel, I just don't understand Shakespeare. As the audience has grown, the one thing we've gotten uh, people saying more than anything else is, I, I understood it. The audience's understanding led Flatwater Shakespeare to be recognized in Lincoln for a Mayor's Art Award for Outstanding Event in 2011. 
The honoring of his work in theater was followed by an art exhibit in the summer of 2012 at the Nebraska History Museum. Through all of this though, Bob's passion is still in telling a good story. Storytelling is storytelling. A good story is, uh, has a beginning, middle, and an end usually, at least traditionally. And you learn to do the things that set up that story. How does the physical business that you create either visually for comics or visually with actors for uh, the theater, how does that go together to advance the story? Doing both things was, was actually, I think, very, very, very satisfying work, and I, I enjoyed that a lot. That night, I planned my suicide. I was going to go to a nice hotel and take my shotgun, broken down in a suitcase, and end it there. That was John McAlpin's reaction upon hearing that he had cancer. I just uh, decided I wasn't going to die that kind of death. Just one day after having a tumor in his small intestine removed, the surgeon told McAlpin that though the surgery was successful, they had found cancer in his lymph nodes. I took that to mean my cancer was terminal, that it had, it had spread throughout my body. The next day, John was visited by Dr. David Silverberg, an oncologist. He said, so Mr. McAlpin, tell me about your cancer. And I told him I knew it was terminal. He said, who told you your cancer's terminal? And I said, no one had to, I, I just know. He said, Mr. McAlpin, I will make a deal with you. If you promise to maintain a positive attitude, and it's vital that you do, I will give you your life back. And instantly I did a 180. John immediately started treatment at Methodist Estabrook Cancer Center. I didn't know what to expect. I, I guess I expected death and dying. Last thing in the world I expected was Barnum and Bailey in the form of Joyce and Ethel, the two greeters. And Ethel had me laughing before I got to the front desk and Joyce is just f so full of love and hugs. Good morning, honey. how you doing? Good morning, I'm living. I began to realize I'm not walking into death and dying, I'm I'm coming into a new family here. John had a CAT scan at the end of six months. He was cancer free, but the good news would be short lived. Six months later, he found two tumors. John endured hard chemo and several rounds of radiation. In the midst of his treatment, he found out that Ethel was retiring from her job at the front door. I told my wife I'm going to apply for that position. She thought I was nuts, she said, you're 61 years old, you have terminal cancer. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm 61, I've got terminal cancer, I'm perfect for it. John got the job, and through radiation and chemo, he stood at the door of Estabrook. Hi, hi, how are we doing today? Welcoming weary patients. You need help finding where you're going? <laughs> Every day. Right, Texas Center. Access Center, yes. okay. For four hours a day. During the, uh, the worst days, the hardest days, I had a button made, and I wore it on my smock every day. It says, my cancer is terminal. I'm not. Hello, ladies, how are we doing? Good, how are you? Doing good. You know, most people go through their life, they never find their calling. Oh, good to see you again. Good to see you. They do a job, they raise a family, they have grandkids. Sir, can I take the wheelchair for you? No, I need it. No, I mean, can I push it? Oh, push it. Okay. No, I, I push her around all the time. You push her around all the time, okay. <laughs> they never really find what they were born for. This is my last visit for three months, so okay. I won't see you for a while. I found it. <laughs> 
I know exactly what I was born for. Maybe I'll see you for a six month checkup. Yes. Okay. So, I'll walk you out. All right. I'm doing it. Yeah. Mary, is it okay if I pray for you? You bet. Okay. That would be great. Lord, we just lift Mary up to you. This isn't a job, this is a ministry. Thank you very much. You betcha. All that right. was very nice. Bye bye. You know, I wouldn't trade my life with anybody. Watch our stories online at netnebraska.org slash Nebraska Stories. And go to Facebook to like us and leave a comment. Join the Nebraska Stories conversation. Nebraska Stories is funded by the Margaret and Martha Thomas Foundation, the Nebraska Office of Highway Safety, Humanities Nebraska, the Nebraska Tourism Commission, and First Nebraska Bank. Sustained funding for arts coverage is provided by the H. Lee and Carol Gindler Charitable Fund, the Nebraska Arts Council, and Nebraska Cultural Endowment.